at here. Um, so the first first thing, first couple of things. One is that uh, we at the Hyperledger uh, community work with the Linux Foundation rules. One of which is, of course, antitrust policy. We go by the antitrust policy. The other is the code of conduct, which uh, says that even when you disagree with people, you are not disagreeable. That is the, um, these are the two operating principles. Other than that, we do, you know, we, we are completely open. Everybody is welcome. And that is the uh, message of this group. Um, so I had prepared a short uh, set of slides to guide our conversation today, but uh, I'm more interested in um, hearing from people about what they would like to see here in this group uh, in the coming year. We have had some fantastic presentations last year. Uh, so I'll go over some of them just to um, remind everyone what uh, you know we what we started and what we had here last year. Uh, the other thing I want to say is that we are um, so Miguel has uh, raised his hand, so I'm going to let him speak. Uh, what what and anyone can interrupt at any point. That is the other. Oh, I'm breaking up. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, I thought maybe it was just me, but you, you've uh, you've been kind of cutting in and out, I think. Maybe because I'm uh, turning my head away from my my webcam. I don't know, or maybe it's my uh, internet uh, connection, which is probably choppy. Um, So based on all this, does, uh, you know, maybe we should go down the list and ask people to speak because if my internet is bad, it's, it's not a good thing uh, that you won't be able to hear me anyway. So it might be better for other people to speak. So I see that uh, David is here, David Boswell, who is a community architect in Hyperledger. So one of the themes of this meeting is how to present what we already have, the resources that we already have to others. Um, okay, so that's... Hey, Vipin, yeah, I, I heard you mention my name. So just to introduce myself quickly, hey everybody, my name is David Boswell. As Vipin said, I'm a staff member at Hyperledger. I just wanted to dial in and yeah, hear what the group was planning for the year. And again, just to see if I could support. And I didn't, uh, yeah, Vipin, I didn't hear everything you said because you are chopping up a little bit. So I don't know if you, if there was a specific question for me or not, I'm happy to answer it. Well, one of the things that came up is uh, how can we better present our materials to the group? Okay. Yeah, I caught half of that. I don't, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just not hearing. Maybe if we type in chat or something, I can, I can respond. Okay, so the question, please let me know how we can share our resources. So is this share our resources within the group or more broadly to the whole community? Because uh, I think there might be different strategies for both. So just, by the way, I don't know if my audio is coming through or not. So if people are having problem hearing me, let me know. Okay, 
Um, so for broadly, one thing that we've been talking about recently is making better use of some of our uh, uh, channels. So for example, uh, um, last year we were experimenting with <clears throat> live streaming virtual Hyperledger meetups, and that's actually been really effective. It's, <clears throat> excuse me, had something in my throat. It's helped us connect with more people. The YouTube platform is, our, our YouTube channel is growing pretty quickly. We have over 12,000 subscribers and we've seen, for example, live streaming a presentation helps connect with a lot more people, like up to 20 more people at a time, uh, you know, in real time, see the presentation there. So we're playing around with, you know, how do we roll that out more broadly? Again, it started off with virtual meetups. Now we're looking at doing presentations that SIGs are doing. So anyway, that's a thought that's just come up in recent discussions. Um, as far as sharing within the group, I have to admit, I, I'm not that familiar with what's been done within the identity working group in the past. I mean, if, if there was, you know, if somebody, you know, wanted to share what the, the strategy was in 2020, I'm happy to, you know, talk through, you know, maybe ways that we could, you know, tweak it or, or take some best practices from other groups. Like I said, I was here to just kind of learn more. Uh, you know, I admit that I don't know a ton about what the group has been doing. And I see somebody else is asking, yeah, yeah, maybe a, a, if we're talking about, uh, you know, a 2021 strategy for the group, maybe wrapping up or maybe starting with a, you know, a wrap up of 2020 activities and strategy could be uh, uh, useful. I see that Michael also asked for that in the chat. Yeah, I'm not hearing any talk right now. I see some chat. I don't know, is anybody able to maybe do a recap? Completely not. Hey, David, it shows you being on mute, my friend. Yeah, I was just saying that I, you know, I was, it seems like it'd be helpful for me and maybe some other people in chat too are asking for maybe a recap of both what the group has done in 2020 as well as uh, maybe a recap of the charter. Like I said, I don't have a lot of history of the group, so it's hard for me to make recommendations about maybe things to do differently. And I see other people in chat are saying a little bit of history would be helpful too. I don't know, maybe we lost Fippen. Yeah, I think he's having some audio problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does somebody else have some of that history of the group they want to share? Can you hear me at all or no? Uh, a little bit. I mean, at all, yeah. Yeah, it seemed like it chopped a little bit, but I heard, I wasn't hearing you for a second, but uh, yeah, I'm hearing you now. Okay, I'm, I'm going to make sure that that link is good of that uh, presentation. And then I'll also put in the ch chat, uh, in the chat, the link to the, link to the identity working group wiki. Is, is uh, are people able to hear me or no? Still no. It's really cutting in and out. I, I hear you some. Okay, sorry. Well, some. 
All right, I'm going to put in the chat. Maybe I'll share my screen and I'll run through it uh, what I can. Yeah, this isn't really working. Yeah, I, I understand. All right. Um, presentation link I sent. Um, I'm going to start sharing the screen. If you can hear me, it's great. Otherwise, we take it from there. The charter has the material. Otherwise, you know, we, we um, call it a day for me anyway, and you guys can uh, continue. I wasn't uh, expecting yeah, this. Yeah, and Vivian, if it's helpful for me to show up at another call to talk through maybe 2021 plans. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. interrupt. Uh, you know, uh, so I can try to share the screen and work through it, but uh, I don't know whether it's going to. So, can you guys see my screen at all? Yes. Yeah, I see your screen. Yeah, we can. Okay, so it's basically, you know, this thing is for everybody, for you to be uh, participating rather than. Uh, rather than anybody else. So uh, I think it would help if people go through this, uh, go through why they're here. And uh, some of you have participated in this uh, quite extensively. So uh, it might be better because then you can talk about what you have taken away from this uh, group and what, you, what we can uh, share. So should I be calling on people or how, how does this work? I'll be happy to pipe up. Uh, Jim St. Clair, uh, first time coming to the meeting. Um, I'm uh, active with uh, Dan in uh, TOIP as well as several of the diff working groups uh, and have been making an effort for 2021 to get more into the Hyperledger uh, uh, SIGs and working groups as well. Uh, I'm from Lumetic. Our focus is uh, patient-centric identity management uh, and part of Providence Health Systems in Seattle. Let's go down the list, if we can. Uh, so I can jump in, I guess. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Patronakis. I am a postdoctoral researcher uh, at CERT, which is uh, Greece's largest uh, research institute. I'm representing uh, the Pharma Ledger uh, Horizon 2020 project, in which we are leading the technical efforts for identity management. And we are looking towards um, uh, technical solutions of ARIS to business or on My name is Roland Faure. I'm the CEO of uh, the company uh, small business Aero Sur Sûreté. Uh, we are working uh, on Hyperledger Indy and uh, Hyperledger Arias uh, on uh, a supply chain environment related to hazardous goods and uh, identity. Uh, I'm Michael Herman. I'm a self-sovereign blockchain architect. I live on a cattle ranch in Alberta, Canada. 
Uh, my project is the Trusted Digital Web. Um, I've been around the whole SSI decentralized identity thing for about three years now. Uh, time to time, I get very deep in terms of my contributions and times like today, I'm just lurking around. Uh, I've just recently published a white paper called SSI Public Data Usage Licensing that may be of interest to this group. Uh, public Data Usage Licensing, I'll, I'll drop a link in the chat. Thank you. So what are the themes of that particular um, paper? So the, the overarching scenario, or, or in general, when, you know, from the early days of SSI, and I go back to Joe, I forget, Joe A's, um, he had some principles of SSI, but there's a whole idea that you would present your identity, that you'd have your own self-sovereign identity, and that you would present that identity, you know, to a website or to an application, and, and that you would control how your identity is used, how, how the identifier is used, how that application could attach identity. There's kind of this Nirvana scenario, but I've never seen anybody actually act on it. So this white paper talks about how Alice, a user might present um, a personal data usage license to an application uh, in terms of what she's choosing to selectively disclose to that application. And then in turn, the white paper looks from the application side um, uh, Bob's app will have a set of roles that's also defined by a similar set of claims in terms of personal information it needs. And depending on what Alice is willing to disclose, she is able to have certain roles within Bob's application and, and vice versa. It's, it's, it's a little bit long, the white paper, but it's an easy read. Great, I've seen your name um, and your uh, contributions because I am a lurker uh, on uh, just, just the, other thing pitch, the other thing I'll pitch because it, uh, it's very top of mind is I'm investigating a, a file format, a serialization format for verified credentials. Um, and it's kind of related to this idea of how do you present um, your identity or how do you present a credential to another application. Um, yeah, and so there's an active discussion going on in the uh, CCG mailing list. I, I can post a link there. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I, I, like I said, I'm a lurker on the CCG uh, mailing list. You can hear me better now, I hope. Yeah, we can, yeah. Yeah, because I did... Uh, uh, reconnect. <laughs> so hopefully that that makes things easier and better. Yeah, that's uh, a lot better. Uh, so Stefan, I think you should yes. go because because uh, you you made a presentation or two, especially from the European perspective, uh, and I and I'll go back to the uh, uh, slides to show you know, the, the various places that we have had these presentations. But Stefan, please. Okay, um, so my name is Stefan Mui. I have, uh, I'm a financial uh, consultant working for the um, digital transition matters. I've been, um, I've experienced in, uh, you know, my background is certainly uh, in compliance and legal issues for the banking sector. Um, I'm currently working on um, identity proofing, well, remote identity proofing specifications for the Etsy standardization um, organization. In fact, we just released a couple of, a few weeks ago, a draft uh, to that effect. I'm also um, working on a new assignment for the uh, European Commission to on KYC portability. Um, which uh, is not directly related to, um, I would say, decentralized or SSI schemes, but certainly is um, uh, somehow related to that topic as well. Um, 
and um, that's something I've been I've been involved with the European Commission work for on that um, theme, wider theme, uh, for a couple of years. And this is relevant because you may know that there is uh, work ongoing currently to revise the EIDAS framework and make it uh, more consistent with uh, uh, the latest uh, trends in the identity um, arena. Beautiful. Um... Alfonso. Hi, thank you for letting Hi, everyone. I'm Alfonso Govela from uh, Merida, Mexico. I came to this group interested in IoT for smart cities, in particular uh, solar panels. And then I became quite interested in SSI, still learning. I am part of the Hyperledger New Latin American chapter and a co-chair of the learning materials and development working group here also at uh, Hyperledger. Happy to be with you learning every day. That's a spirit. Um, Dan Backenheimer, who's of course been a stalwart contributor to this group uh, and uh, he has made a couple of presentations, uh, a presentation last year, which I call out in my slides. Um, anyway, uh, Dan, please go ahead and uh, talk about your uh, your interest and what we should be going doing going forward. You know that is the key theme of this meeting. Are you around, Dan, or? So let, let us go down the list. Uh, Gary DiGruccio, uh, basically I saw that you just joined uh, and we are just going down the list of participants uh, talking about what is uh, what we should be working on for the next year. And uh, uh, you know, I had a presentation ready, but I had some audio problems. Looks like the audio problems have gone away, but uh, uh, you know, basically, what are you in? Uh, you know, what are you working on? That kind of thing, you know. So, yeah, that I, so I actually, I, I've been on something of a hiatus since since the summer. I'm, I'm actually just getting back into uh, participating with the group, <clears throat> so I'm I'm still trying to come up to speed on what's going on. Oh, beautiful. Okay. Um, Jim is already gone, um, Alfonso, David, Chris. Um, now, Luca Boldrin, which is who's another uh, person who has uh, contributed to this group. Yes. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, <clears throat> from the, the yes, my background is on the certification authority and PKI stuff. My company is mostly a trust service provider in the IDAS framework. But we are working since a few years, uh, at least well, five years of this, in uh, the self sovereign environment. We are developing from there. We're very much connected to the IDAS world, which <clears throat> Stefan mentioned before. And we are now looking forward to what's happening with the new mood of uh, integrating identity with payment systems in, with the concept of central bank digital currencies and the like. I'm, I'm fond of this, of this group and I try to attend even if I can't make it very regularly, uh, but because of the diversity and uh, of the amount of different topics which are addressed in quite trans trans transversal with respect to uh, other fora. So thanks Vipin for, for keeping it up. All right, uh, the next person, I think it's Charles, no. Uh, anyway, I think everybody has gone, so gone uh, over why they're here. So I'm gonna try to 
um, try to go over the slides that I had prepared. Uh, it looks like I'm in a better shape now. Um, you know, so the roadmap slides. Um, The first call that we had, um, not the first, but one of the first calls that we had was with uh, Kim Cameron, who's a legend, obviously. Uh, but his main theme was how people are, uh, the personal digital transformation is happening and how that is, uh, uh, you know, it is a process. It is not uh, something that is going to happen like the crack of a whip. It is going to happen slowly. And he's um, had, you know, his views are also in that slide and that slide will be, uh, you know, this slide has uh, links to all of the, uh, all of the recordings that we have had. And then we had, he talk about the data protection regulation. Uh, Stefan mentioned some uh, about Europe. We also had people from India talking about it. And uh, in, in one of the slides, following slides, I will uh, show how things have changed between 2019 and 2020. Then uh, the next one is uh, Dan's known traveler digital identity which has all these elements in play, which is, uh, you know, the serialization format, the semantics, the way in which these things can be presented and so on. Uh, then we had several sessions on contact tracing and anonymization uh, in the first days of the pandemic and people uh, were kind of upset saying, you know, what does this have to do with identity? Uh, but slowly looks like more and more people are drawn into this. And uh, there is a whole session today at WHO like uh, Jim mentioned, uh, vaccines uh, credentials initiative or smart vaccines or whatever it's called today. Uh, and uh, European, this is the next one, which uh, Stefan talked about. And one of the main things that happened last year was of course the creation of TOIP, uh, the new group in uh, Linux Foundation. Uh, then we had a presentation on or cactus with identity focus. Also a presentation from the Global Legal Entity Foundation with uh, roles in the enterprise. Uh, another, another one was the universal wallet concept, which uh, uh, which also had a very interesting presentation. Uh, then vaccinations and uh, COVID credentials, uh, then uh, MPC securing the enterprise using uh, unbound uh, technology. Then on consent management, uh, semantic working group uh, from TOIP, uh, now there's three groups in TOIP dealing with semantics. Uh, well, I should probably not say TOIP, I should say T-O-I-P because Jim Jordan is uh, very particular about that. Uh, and the state of SSI, which had a membership of 65 people in this call, that was given by Drummond and he's going to come back next month. 
then uh, biometrics, which is a big topic, and how does biometrics coexist with SSI? Uh, and carry, which is a digital key management solution that is top of the mind for everyone today. Uh, two things that I want to say is that uh, what, uh, somebody had asked, what is the charter of the group? Uh, the charter was to talk about all uh, identity uh, problems in or identity solutions in uh, Hyperledger. And uh, we have to say that the that identity is one of the foundational concepts in uh, blockchains. Many of these uh, talks have nothing to do with uh, DLTs or blockchain directly. But in the end, they all come back to the idea of a global witness, which even in a society uses some form of DLT. Uh, this is just a screen showing the comprehensive data protection laws in 2019. And I just want to show you the transformation that happened. Uh, looks like China's uh, start, started out a, a, a new law uh, for data protection of its citizens, but I do not know how effective that will be because the government is um, engaged in surveillance according to many, we have no real idea. The other, uh, other place that uh, things changed was in Egypt, in, in Africa, there are some places where the privacy laws are being enacted. In the United States, as you know, that kind of a comprehensive privacy law is not there and it probably will never be enacted because there is a very strong pushback against uh, that kind of a situation. Uh, although in country, in um, it is a federated system, so there is lots of uh, different ways in which the laws can be enacted. Uh, Jim, uh, you have something to say? Oh, you just touched upon it, but I was going to comment in general that um, number one, the HIPAA privacy law is going through a notice of proposed rulemaking, um, which will which will uh, uh, probably expand the context around patient consent and patient access. And uh, and to your last point, now obviously California already has the CCP, a CCPA. They're going to CPRA, um, and there's about uh, according to the legal newsletters I follow about. Uh, 14 states. So it wouldn't surprise me if the Biden administration started looking at something federal that would harmonize um, uh, privacy laws, because the, the problem is, pro is, is probably going to come up that different states have different laws that you know mimic GDPR or have similarities to it, which will make it too hard to operate without federal guidance. Yeah, um, I think GDPR was a uh very important law because of the fact that it is not only protecting European citizens, it is protecting citizens elsewhere. Because of the way the law is enacted, most uh, global companies have to uh, comply with the law, which means that they enact similar laws, I mean, uh, similar uh, protections even in the countries that do not have such a law. I don't know what the Canadian situation is because here in this uh, map, it shows uh, Canada is blue, which is a comprehensive data protection law has been enacted. Uh, I don't know too much about it. And the whole of South uh, America seems like it, it's got some solid protections. The Russians have. 
and so does Australia. So in order to comply with all of these, uh, you know, obviously the move is towards uh, giving the data back, control back to the citizens. And uh, so to recap, some of the things that we talked about here, one of them is the, you know, make the material accessible and searchable, which was the first point I opened with, although I couldn't be heard. Uh, we have a paper that is about identity and blockchains, and it has been stalled for a couple of years now uh, because we felt like the landscape was changing so rapidly that we did not have a way to keep up with it. So things looks like things are uh, shaking out and there's more clarity. I think the whole point that a personal digital transformation is underway where people who are even so-called digital natives are slowly realizing the deleterious, the bad effects of uh, oversharing and the lack of protection. So it is not just the older people who are used to a more, uh, you know, personal data protection, but also everyone else. And I think that that's what Jim was talking about that, you know, he, he, he was talking about specifically about the healthcare system, but unless there's a comprehensive law that protects um, everything from financial transactions to healthcare to you know various other forms of data gathering and misuse. Of course, that uh, goes directly to this whole uh, vaccines credentials and interoperability situation with the smart vaccine certificate, vaccination certificate. And we also work with the Digital Identity Foundation. Dan, uh, you had something to say, please. Well, yeah, to, to your previous point of, yeah, you mentioned biometrics before, um, and that part, you know, and, and the same thing as, you know, what Jim was talking about with health credentials, you know, we see a lot of, um, you know, federal and state, you know, in the US and, and other countries, banning the use of uh, biometrics um, for, for various reasons. Uh, um, and, and yet GDPR, as, as you were saying before, you know, covers that as, you know, not just personal data, but sensitive personal data, just like health. So I, I just was bringing that up in the context of what you're talking about um, in terms of comprehensive laws to protect all PII, including health, including biometrics and, and others, but that, that was it. Yeah, but since you are the biometrics um, uh, czar of this group, uh, I would ask you to say, what, what are the prospects? Because the problem is, it's two-edged, right? One is uh, biometrics are seen as a kind of a nuclear option, meaning if you lose that and if somebody can spoof that, you know, then they've uh, really can take over somebody's identity. On the other hand, that is linking someone very definitively with their uh, biometrics. Uh, so you have the two sides of the same, of, of this coin. Uh, and I'm wondering whether you can say something more about uh, what's happening there. Right, well, you, you, yeah, you, you kind of let, um, said it, but you know, when we talk about health credentials and, and um, uh, identity credentials, the, you know, I could, you know, right now the U.S. Um, the uh, CDC provides you the little white card that sometimes they actually fill in your name, first name and last name, and then it would say the date and what, what um, vaccination you got. Um, so, but, they, but it's not bound to an identity. Even if they filled in my name, it's still not bound to an identity. Now, now there's all this activity, as you're saying, like the WHO is, 
is doing today. Um, now we do have folks representing this, but in general, all the the other health credential um, uh, uh, activities that we see out there in the news, they really either don't think of identity or or think of it in, in passing of how you bind the identity both when you are at the lab getting a test or getting a vaccination, um, how, do they, how do they identify you? Um, so that when you then get something associated with you, perhaps it's you, and then you go and travel and present that vaccination or that test result, how do they know that it was provisioned to that person? Um, you know, and and not their brother, or not somebody that they paid to take the test for them, and the the the, um, uh, the one of the most um, uh, secure ways of doing that is through biometrics um, to bind an identity claim, including a health credential, to the presenter of that claim. Now, then you talk about the ability to you know potentially spoof a biometric. Um, there is that potential. Um, in ISO world, we published the uh, 30107-3 that talks about presentation attack detection, and there's um, uh, te algorithms, techniques to, uh, to detect presentation attacks in face, finger, iris, voice. Um, is it foolproof? No, but um, uh, there are methods to, um, uh, to detect it. Anybody that says anti-spoof, I discount right away because you can detect spoofs you can't have software to to uh, you know uh, to to not have somebody attempt to spoof you. Um, they will attempt, and the best you can do is detect it. Um, anyhow, and there's movements of of um, in you know uh, more privacy enhancing biometrics that that do matching in the hash domain. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll see more about that. Um, the, you know, you, you're giving up a bit of uh, performance accuracy in that case uh, to get more privacy. And in some cases that's gonna be uh, acceptable, you know, especially in humanitarian cases, you know, launching nuclear codes, you probably don't want to lose performance uh, in terms of accuracy or border crossing, but, you know, there's other things that, um, you know, low low financial risk transactions. Um, you know, could could use that. Anyhow, um, yeah, happy to answer any questions. But that's you know that that's a, a, a quick brain dump. Yeah, I mean, you know that we had that presentation just a couple of weeks ago on biometrics and SSI. Um, I think that the carry thing there is is uh, sort of a, a, a not you know not correct there, but it, it, I wanted to you have that as separate. But anyway, going back to the biometrics and SSI, is the you know use of biometrics uh, um, and SSI contradictory or uh, no not no not at all. Not at all, right? And, I mean, and KDTI, you mentioned that before. Yes. Right, KDTI.org, you can go and watch a little video, read up about it. But but it, basically, it's another, you know, your biometric identifier is another verifiable claim where, you know, packaged into a verifiable credential that, you know, to have that seamless travel experience, I, you know, I selectively disclose certain information, let's say to my airline, we selectively disclose it to the uh, the departure border agency, the arrival border agency, the security agency, maybe my car rental agency, uh, but let's focus on my airline. So I, I have as a, um, an attestation in my wallet, my boarding pass information and my um, passport information, including my biometric. The only biometric that's required in all uh, a KO 9303 um, uh, documents, the e-passport and data group two or is, a, is an ISO compliant photo. So that is a biometric. It is included in a verifiable credential called an e-passport today. We have the same thing in KDTI. So what does that buy me? I could share, selectively disclose ahead of time my boarding pass information um, and, and some of my um, uh, 
basically passport information, my, my photo, my first name, last name. I share that with my uh, airline. Now I'm getting ready to board this um, A380, um, you know, 525 people. I don't have to take out my boarding pass, my passport. I walk up to the, you know, the boarding gate. Um, it captures my face. It does a one to 528 to a 525, I guess, um, search. It says, oh yeah, that's, I recognize his face. It is Dan. Um, I, I've updated my manifest that he's biometrically bored. I have a more accurate manifest. And that's a, an example of using biometrics in, in SSI. Now, where GDPR comes into play is I and 525 other people shared my, my sensitive um, personal data with that airline. They have to protect it. They have to tell me how long they're going to use it. How are they going to protect it? When are they going to delete it? Typically within 24 hours. Um, if they share it, who do they share it with and all that kind of crap. So GDPR does apply, maybe not to my, uh, to, you know, uh, to my wallet or maybe differently to my wallet than it does to the airline, because now the airline has, at least for a certain amount of time, PII, including biometric information for a bunch of folks. Yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned two things which I think is important. Which, which are important. One is, uh, I, do, I do believe, uh, I'm not believe, I subscribe to the notion that uh, Ian Grigg uh, said, and which, which makes sense, which is basically identity is an edge protocol. That means that the more nodes, the more things, uh, that attest to my identity, uh, the more difficult it is to spoof that identity because there are, let's say, if you use uh, a palm veins or a gate along with something else, then it is pretty sure that, you know, I'm the person who I say I am. Of course, the other, other part is you know the presentation. Uh, you know the what is what is needed in order to identity proof. This is what Stefan was talking about, uh, which of course the the NIST also goes into great detail about what is needed for identity proofing, which of course break, uh, uh, makes it legal to use multiple methods and strengthen your proof. Uh, you know, so it's it's very difficult uh, to spoof somebody if you're using uh, multiple methods that are that are in different domains, uh, including biometrics. But in the end, biometrics uh, we we spoke about this briefly, which is uh, do you store that? information directly in the in a, in some kind of a data space or you store uh, a hash based uh, sort of a matching uh, pattern that are that cannot be uh, reversed uh, and you said that for recoverability sometimes that data is stored But with all the stuff that has been happening in terms of people breaking in uh, into all the honeypots, all the different uh, places where data is being stored and uh, being able to get that data out, the movement towards personal digital transformation that Kim Cameron was mentioning is leading to decentralization, leading to ways of storing data uh, on the edges uh, in, and in a way that can be one, recovered, two, revoked, and presented. And since decentralization would prevent 
a large scale uh, theory of this data, then that's, you know, that's even better. So uh, the next, case, next uh, thing here, you know, which is financial use cases. So these are the themes for 2021 and people will be uh, showing up and talking about some of these. Uh, the financial use cases uh, for digital currencies I've mentioned because I'm involved with the digital currency global initiative and I had forwarded that to the identity working group and the capital markets working group uh, so that people can uh, participate directly in that and digital currencies is a, uh, uh, as you know are, are a hot item right now, especially with uh, cryptocurrencies and everything else going haywire. Uh, but this is about developing standards for digital currency interoperation. And I believe that identity uh, is one of the pivot points for that. Going down the list, we have uh, capabilities versus access control link, uh, uh, links, which you know I have linked to that uh, a paper that uh, actually is W3C, I believe, was who have hosted that, and we want to talk about that. The last item, solid, is uh, Sir uh, Tim Berners Lee's uh, effort uh, for having pods. So we'll talk about that, and also about Kerry as a uh, DKMS. And obviously, uh, a lot of this work is already going on in, uh, you know, different places. But we want to, you know, we want to, we want to talk about it in the context of hyperledger. So the one of the last things I would say is that there is a hyperledger global forum happening. And if you have any ideas for a paper, for a presentation, uh, please uh, present it to the uh, program committee and hopefully uh, they will choose your paper. And I will uh, send out that information as well on the mailing list. I think that's about it for now. And uh, I hope this has been useful, even though I started out with a bit of a problem with the audio. Uh, anyone else has anything to say, in, including uh, David? You know, please, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. It was helpful to hear more about things that have happened and things you're planning. For example, that paper. Again, if there are ways that this group is wanting support, you can reach out to me. We've done, we have published a couple of papers, for example, for some special interest groups. So, you know, there's a process we could follow. I know some other working groups have published papers as well. But anyway, thanks for letting me listen in and, you know, let me feel free to reach out if there are ways I can help what you're wanting to do this year. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.